Welcome back, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Senator Tom Cotton joins us. Good morning, Senator. Welcome back. Good morning, Hugh. It's good to be on with you. I have a dilemma, which I'm hoping you can help me with. I'm, of course, rooting for the Kansas City Chiefs over the, the Ravens. But the Lions are playing the 49ers. And this is a dilemma because we, we, we know the Lions have never been to the Super Bowl. And the only other original NFL team that hasn't been to the Super Bowl is the Browns. And I don't want them to get there before the Browns. But the 49ers are the 40. What are you doing on that one, Senator Cotton? <laughs> I would imagine that most of the middle of the country will be rooting for the Lions. That's where my son said they want to root for. I'll be pulling for the Lions as well. Nothing against the 49ers. All right. So are you in uh, New Hampshire campaigning for or the former president, or are you working on the border bill? We are, uh, we are in session, so we're in Washington voting. It, uh, it would appear, judging by... The polls and the momentum on the ground, the president doesn't need any help campaigning in New Hampshire. That He's got, got all the strength he needs. I think he's going to have a, a big resounding victory tonight, and that will make him the presumptive nominee. And I hope if, uh, if that happens tonight, then we can all rally around uh, President Trump and, and focus our fire where it deserves to be, which is on Joe Biden and the Democratic Party. Well, I would like to do that, but I am afraid that the Republicans are about to drive over a cliff that they've driven over three times in the course of my career in the, on this show, where they've signed on in the Senate to an immigration compromise, which dead on arrival in the House. And I think they're going to do it again. What do you know? Well, Hugh, the, uh, the negotiations are ongoing, so I won't pass judgment on any bill until we actually have the text of it and evaluate uh, what effect it will have. I think the point you're making, Hugh, though, is well taken. We're, we don't want a deal for a deal's sake. Uh, we don't want a, a deal that's not going to work. We want a deal that will work, that will actually stop the flow of thousands of migrants a day every single day across our southern border. And if the Democrats refuse to uh, grant those reforms because they're more invested ideologically in open borders, then we'll just have to take this issue to the voters in November. Well, that's that's what I agree with, because eight million people have been, quote, encountered in the Biden years in three years. That does not count Gataways. We had one hundred and sixty five people on the terror watch list. And I want a wall. And I know all the reasons against the wall. It doesn't work. It doesn't go far enough. They can build tunnels. They can bring ladders. But let's talk about the wall for a second, Senator. Does it ever come up in the conference that it is the visible symbol that the base is demanding? Well, you, you've used an apt phrase for many years, going back at least to that terrible 2007 deal that fortunately died. Yep. That the wall is a is a visible expression of an invisible commitment or uh, or will. Yep. And I think that's a very important point. And, and you're right that a wall is a sufficient or a necessary but not sufficient uh, step in controlling our border. But it is necessary, um, especially in high traffic areas that don't have own natural barriers or difficulties. Um, yes, you have to supplement it with Border Patrol officers to observe it and technology uh, and coordination. But a wall is very simply something that just sits there and works. Human beings have built walls around their civilizations since the dawn of civilization, since the dawn of recorded time, because walls or fences or barriers or whatever you want to call it works. And if it didn't work, then Joe Biden would take down the fence around the White House. A wall yeah. works and a wall is part of the solution at the border. The the Israelis are not going to not rebuild their fence. They're going to build two of them uh, because the one on ten seven proved inadequate. The Finns are building a wall on their border with Russia. Uh, they're they're just as and Hungary is building a wall to stop migration into their country. Yeah. I don't understand why people don't understand. Seventy five percent is better than zero percent. Well, yeah, I mean, Hugh, again, it's just illogical. I mean, to say that. You know, a wall doesn't work is like saying, you know, fire doesn't work. Like, of course, a wall works. Again, it, it's not a 100 percent solution. It has to be supplemented. You know, in, in the Army, we used to uh, say that, uh, you know, an obstacle without observation is not an obstacle. That's because uh, bad guys with enough time can breach any obstacle. But you had to have the obstacle. Like, we didn't just sit there and have only observation posts. We built walls and fences and barriers around our posts and then supplemented it with soldiers and guard posts, the analog of a Border Patrol agent, or with technology so people can't climb over it or tunnel underneath it. But a wall is the simplest solution in many parts of the border. All right, now I want to turn to Israel. Uh, the deadliest day in the war for Israel since 10-7 occurred yesterday when 24 IDF troops died, 21 in a building collapse, three officers in, in heavy fighting around Khan Yunus. It occurred on the same day that the Biden administration is using the Wall Street Journal to say that 
you know, we don't have to destroy Hamas. I had Ambassador Haley on yesterday. She thought that was a, quote, disgusting comment by the Biden administration. Do you sense Team Biden is backing away from Israel now? Oh, there's no question about that, Hugh. And it's not just new in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. I mean, for a couple months now, uh, Joe Biden and the Democrats have been ready to throw in the towel um, in the fight against Hamas. And it's important to note why they want to do this. It's not because of some grand strategic calculation, Hugh. It's because Joe Biden now views Israel and this war as a political liability that is costing him political support among the far left anti-Semitic wing of the Democratic Party, some of whose votes are necessary for him to win re-election in November in places like Michigan and maybe Ohio and Pennsylvania. So they're making a political calculation about an existential threat that Israel faces. Uh, it is appalling. Uh, and, and I hope that Israel ignores these people. And I hope our, our party campaigns on supporting Israel. Do you think that will have traction in the fall? If we are 100 percent with Israel and we communicate that, do you think that moves at least a small percentage of voters? Oh, I think there's no question, Hugh, uh, that voters across the country um, are going to be moved uh, against what they see as the growing tide of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in the Democratic Party. And Joe Biden's apparent unwillingness to stand up and, and refute those wings of his party, but rather to cave to them and start putting pressure on, on Israel to find some kind of accommodation uh, again with a bloodthirsty terrorist group that burned children alive and gang raped women before brutally uh, mutilating and killing them. Um, Israel can can not accept this state of affairs anymore. The Republican Party and Donald Trump recognize that and will be forced square behind Israel. Joe Biden and the Democratic Party is looking to find some kind of accommodation with Hamas. That's not what the American people want. Now, I want to turn for a moment to something that's parochial. You and I are Harvard guys. Uh, I think you spent seven years there. Did you do three years undergrad or four years undergrad? I did three years undergrad here and then law school, so I was able to get away with six. You were able to get away with six, and I got four. And I used to like the place, but now they've come up with a new committee, and they got it wrong again. And here's my first just objective question. You're a senior senator in the Republican Party. You're on judiciary, and you're on um, uh, defense, and you're on intel. Has anyone from Harvard called you as an alum of both the law school and the college to ask you what you think about the dilemma that they face to fix their anti-Semitism problem? <laughs> Hardly, Hugh. I think my politics are no longer in fashion at Harvard. They were never in fashion, Hugh, probably like you, uh, you know, many, 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 many decades, <laughs> maybe in the 19th century, um, knew you were in a minority. You know, I mean, as a conservative, we knew we were minorities uh, in college. But, you know, I, I never once felt like a beleaguered or oppressed minority. Um, or even an unwelcome one. I don't think that's the case today when I visit with college students who come to work for me or intern for me. I think in many college campuses across the country, conservatives now feel beleaguered and oppressed and unwelcome. And I think that's doubly true at Ivy League schools like Harvard. I mean, you had, I thought, an eye-opening experience. I think it was last summer when you went back for your Oh, yeah. Uh, And they had some, like, Politburo junior commissar from the alumni office telling you what you could and could not say uh, on campus. Yes, uh, I was so warned. I think the rot, the rot has set in pretty deeply at Harvard. You know, they announced this anti-Semitism task force, yet the, one of the leaders of it uh, is basically an anti-Zionist. You know, it's condemned the entire modern project of Israel. Um, you know, you I, I, but up, here's what I don't understand, Senator. You and Senator Cruz are very high-profile Harvard grads and uh, 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 smart people who could contribute to the conversation, and they haven't called. It's, it's not that they're too big to fail. It's that they cannot not fail because they never ask anyone outside of their blue bubble what they're doing wrong. Well, again, I think it's a, it's a sign of, again, how deep black plotting gay become president, and they think they're the constituencies to which they answer – want to hear them equivocate about anti-Semitism. You know, there's constituencies being, you know, not just alumni or financial backers of the university, but their undergraduate students, their graduate students, their faculty members, their administrators, how divorced their views of those constituencies are from normal Americans' views. And last question, Senator. Penny Pritzker, the former Secretary of Commerce, is the chairman of the Harvard Corporation. 
She is responsible for the disastrous selection of Claudine Gay, and she's running the next one. Her brother is the governor of Illinois. She is an Obama appointee. How much do you think what's going on at Harvard represents the President Obama wing of the Democratic Party sort of institutionalizing itself in elite institutions? I think there's some of that here. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily like Barack Obama and his personal aides pulling the strings behind the scenes, in part because they don't have to, you, because Correct. that anti-American ideological worldview is so deeply embedded in America's universities and media institutions, sometimes even corporate America, that they don't have to call the shots. They're confident that that ideology is going to prevail, even if they take a more passive stance on this or that controversy of the day. Uh, so the last question, Senator, you're on judiciary. I saw a nominee come through who is so far to the left, I can't believe it. Uh, I don't remember the name. The name was unusual. Are they getting more radical in their judicial nominees? <laughs> Um, you know, he was interesting to watch at this stage of the Biden uh, presidency in, in year four. It is a very, very sharp dichotomy between the kinds of nominees we're getting. Uh, in some cases, they're finally getting down to states with two Republican senators. So the nominees are actually not that bad. Some of them I can even support, uh, especially at the district court level from Republican states. On the other hand, in states with two Democratic senators or uh, with open court of appeals seats, if they haven't been nominated and confirmed by this point, they really are the most extreme of all the extremists. So, yeah, we're seeing at the end of last year and now at the beginning of this year some nominees that are just truly beyond the pale. And it's hard for me to believe that some of these nominees will even come up for a vote. You know, I don't, I don't think people like Bob Casey and Sharon Brown will vote no on a Biden judicial nominee. They haven't yet. But, boy, they're probably working overtime behind the scenes, pleading with Chuck Schumer to protect them from those votes. Yeah, I'm just hoping they put those on the agenda and we get full Senate votes on, on some of these people because, boy, they are off the charts. Senator Tom Cotton, thank you, Senator. Always a pleasure. Good luck in fighting a good fight on immigration reform, which isn't reform but should be killed in the cradle. I'll be right back. America, don't go anywhere. 1-800-520-1234. 1-800-520-1234. If you're in New Hampshire,